Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this will be hopefully a fairly brief lecture covering the topic of modeling, which wraps up chapter 7, uh, dealing with dimensional analysis, modeling, and similitude. To close out some of our discussion from the previous in-class lecture, uh, we started discussing some of these common dimensionless groups, right? dimensionless groups that show up frequently in engineering. And we showed that these come from a dimensional analysis of the Navier-Stokes equations themselves. So I want to highlight here, we talked about the Reynolds number, Froude number, the Euler number, the Mach number, and the Struhal number, right? Uh, as well as, and then uh, we didn't get to the Cauchy number or the Weber number in class. But the idea here is that all of these numbers, because of the fact that they originate from the Navier-Stokes equations and the non-dimensionalization of those equations, each one represents a specific ratio of types of forces. So the Reynolds number, for example, indicates the relative importance of inertial forces due to acceleration or deceleration of flow relative to viscous forces created by fluid friction. This idea of uh, each number representing a ratio of forces becomes important here in a few slides when we discuss what's called dynamic similarity. So the actual objectives for today's lecture, the three things I'd like to get to, are the idea of uh, how we can use model scale studies on problems that involve more than three pi terms I want us to apply concepts of what we call similarity or alternately similitude to correctly set up oops to correctly set up or scale our models and I want to understand or I want us to understand how we can rescale model results to describe what we'll call full scale phenomena. Okay, so uh, to put this in some context, right, we've shown up to this point that dimensional analysis can be a tremendously powerful tool, even if we haven't year learned yet how to use it fully. Uh, it allows us to explore relationships between variables that affect fluid flows of interest. In particular, it does two things for us up to this point. It allows us to reduce the number of pi terms, okay, or the number of uh, variables, variables rather, uh, in an unknown relationship. So if this is some, uh, if this is some relationship for fluid flow of interest, where we have a dependent variable and a whole host of independent variables, then application of the Buckingham pi theorem allows us to know that we'll be able to reduce the number of variable, total variables involved by up to r, where r is the number of reference dimensions present. And by going through the process of what we call the method of repeating variables, uh, we're able to find specific, we call pi terms, all of which are dimensionless, uh, and assemble those into a new unknown relationship, which we, uh, so this new functional relationship we describe by phi. So for problems that are pretty simple, okay, those without too many pi terms, it's fairly easy to go out, perform experiments, and then present our data in a way that is universally useful through the process of experimental correlation. If we have only a single pi term, k minus r, 
is equal to 1. We simply say pi 1 is equal to a constant value, which requires us only to perform a single experiment to find that constant, which is then applicable to any uh, problem governed by the same physics. If k minus r is equal to 2, we write pi 1 is equal to some unknown function of pi 2. And then to approximate this function, we collect experiment or experimental data for the variation of pi 1 and pi 2. Allow these to be experiments. And through these experiments, we then fit a curve. Okay, This is the process of correlation. And we use this curve as our empirical best guess to the functional relationship phi. If k minus r is equal to 3, we know that pi 1 is a function of both pi 2 and pi 3, which allows us to represent our experimental data either as a three-dimensional surface, okay, where we have a pi 2, pi 3 plane, and we plot pi 1 as the height above that plane, or to present it as a family of curves. If we have pi 1 versus pi 2, we can systematically set pi 3 equal to a constant sweeping through pi 2, measuring pi 1, and then varying the value of pi 3. However, as the number of pi terms increases, right, we reach a limit where it's simply not uh, efficient any longer to approach problems using this idea of creating a universal scaling relationship or this universal correlation. Uh, this is for two primary reasons. First, the number of experiments required becomes excessive. Secondly, it becomes challenging to even present the data if we manage to collect it. For example, a relationship with four pi terms okay, requires that we plot it in four-dimensional space. The only effective way to do this would be to, as we showed on the last slide, we see pi 2, pi 1. Perhaps we show curves for differing values of pi 3. Pi 3 equals C1 c2, and c3, but then this entire graph okay, corresponds to pi4 being some value that's also a constant. And so we would have to vary pi4. We would have to systematically change the value of pi4 and draw an entirely new family of graphs. So not only do we have a challenge in actually acquiring the data, we have a challenge in presenting it in any way that is easily interpreted by somebody that wants to use our correlations. This is where the idea of modeling theory comes in. When this relationship becomes too complicated for uh, correlations to become uh, practical, we take advantage of the fact that pi terms are dimensionless, right? The idea is, for example, if we consider, so this idea of non-dimensionality, uh, if we consider a pi term that is our Reynolds number, this being u, or, or rather v, okay, uh, fluid velocity times rho times some length scale over viscosity, then if somehow we chose a problem where we were now looking at um, a different length that is where the, the original length scale has been factored up by 10, but at the same time, the viscosity okay, so has also been factored up uh, by 10. 
then our Reynolds number simply won't change. This allows us to, by choosing the correct, uh, the correct combinations of variables, to allow our dimensionless variables to become totally scale independent. And in, uh, in turn, this allows us to perform what we know as scaled model tests that are able to effectively reproduce the way that real world systems behave. The question is, how do we do this? What are the steps involved? If we want to know the, uh, the wind drag or the, or the uh, air resistance on a, uh, on a rocket um, launch stage, how do we correctly design experiments at a smaller scale in a wind tunnel that are going to give us valuable information? And the answer is what we call similitude. Right? Alternatively, depending on the textbook that you're looking at, this is sometimes just referred to as similarity. So to motivate the discussion between now and the end of the, uh, uh, the lecture, we're going to talk about um, for example, a more, a more practical problem, something that's a little bit more down to earth. Uh, let's consider we have a skyscraper, right? Or an office building, and for some reason uh, they've uh, attached a smokestack to this office building, perhaps to vent all of the fumes from the papers that they're burning uh, once the SEC comes to investigate them. Uh, so if we, if we recognize that there's going to be wind, okay, and we as uh, engineers, especially those civil engineers uh, out there, uh, want to know what the wind load on the building is so that you can appropriately design the foundation and the structural members of the building. Um, let's consider that this building also probably has windows. Uh, so the first step, right, and we're beginning from the beginning of dimensional analysis here, uh, is to determine which variables we think might govern uh, this wind drag on the building. So if you need a little bit more practice um, in generating these sort of sets of, of dimensional variables, okay. in other words, if we're looking at the drag building as being a function of what? Uh, if you need a little bit more practice with this, take this opportunity to pause the video and work out on your own what list of variables you think might affect the drag on the building. And then resume the video and uh, check your answer against what we come up with here. Okay, uh, so the proposed list of, uh, of variables may differ in how you choose to, to name the variables, the dimensions of the building, etc. But we should, um, you should hopefully at least have a significant number of the same variables. So let's go ahead and name these as first uh, B, which we'll define as the breadth of the building of the building. W, which we'll define as the width of the building, um, or the depth, depending on how you're looking at it. H, which we'll define as the the height of the building, okay, not including the smokestack. D, the diameter of the smokestack. HS, or rather, let's call this L. L for the, the height of the smokestack itself, or the length of the smokestack. What about these windows? Maybe we're interested in the height of the windows and the width of the windows. So we'll say this is H sub W and W sub W. As well as the number of windows that are actually installed on the building. Okay, so this is a, a physical description of the building itself, but what about uh, external influences, right? we can assume that probably the velocity of the wind um, is going to affect the drag on the building, or the wind speed. And if we consider the wind, right, made of air, um, what are the air properties? So fluid properties are probably going to come into effect. Uh, in particular, 
the density and the viscosity of the air that is blowing past the building. So if we compile these, we've got a drag being a function of velocity, density, viscosity, the height, width, and breadth of the building, or height, width, depth, um, the length of the smokestack, its diameter, the height and width of the windows, as well as the total number of windows in the building. Okay, And you could go on building this list up more and more and more. Perhaps you want to know the dimensions of the door. Perhaps you want to know what the surface roughness of the concrete that they use to, uh, to face the outside of the building is. Right? There's a near infinite list of dimensional variables that might ultimately affect the drag. We'll go ahead and leave it at this list right here. Um, but this idea that you can go on and on and on sort of further demonstrates um, the point of this example. So next step would be to perform a dimensional, or to take this dimensional analysis and apply the method of repeating variables to find what our pi terms of interest are. So if we select velocity, density, and let's say the breadth of the building here as our repeating variables, which dimensionless terms do you think might come out and how many of them are there? Okay, so again, if you need some practice generating pi terms, this is a good opportunity to pause the video for a minute, work out uh, what the pi terms are going to be on your own, and then come back and check. Okay, so with this choice of repeating variables of v, rho, and b, what I get for pi terms are on the left hand side what we know is the drag coefficient, which is drag over rho v squared v squared. As I said, we'll refer to this as the drag coefficient. <coughs> as a function of v times b rho over viscosity, which is, you can hopefully recognize as being our form of Reynolds number. Okay. And then a bunch of geometric uh, pi terms. I mean, the pi terms that are formed entirely out of ratios of different geometric features of the building. For example, the ratio of height to breadth. width to breadth, smokestack height to breadth, diameter to breadth, the height and width of the windows divided by the breadth of the building, and then finally the number of windows is already simply a number. It doesn't have any dimensions or units attached to it, so it does not get modified. It simply is retained. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine dimensionless terms in our proposed relationship. Even more if you included additional things up here, such as uh, the examples I named. If we wanted to create a correlation, you know, some sort of experimental database where a designer could enter in a value for any combination of these terms, right, and come up with a drag coefficient, this would require an absolutely absurd number of experiments. For example, let's say we want to test 10 values of each of these pi terms. The total number of experiments would be 10 to the ninth power because we have, or rather in this case, we have eight independent variables. So it would be 10 to the eighth power. In other words, we're talking about conducting 100 million trials. Um, at model scale. A more efficient approach here would be to ask the architects or the designers which wind condition are you interested in right now? What's your design point? What's the worst case condition you expect to encounter? And what is the design of the building that you want to assess? Uh, so that uh, rather than trying to create a general correlation, we are simply trying to perform a single experiment that will correctly reproduce a specific condition on the specific building. We do this through the concept of what we call prototypes and models. So if we name 
our full scale, the prototype, this being the full building that we hope to build, and the experimental scale geometry we call the model. The idea is we expect that the full scale is going to obey a relationship of I1 P, V of I2 P, I3 P, uh, uh, so on and so on, uh, so forth, all the way to pi 9 p, right? Because we have nine total pi terms. At the model scale, we expect, expect that pi 1 m, okay, where the m denotes that we're talking about model scale. Sorry, my pen died. Let me charge that up for a second. pi 1 m equal to some function of pi 2 m. 3m, so on and so forth, pi 9m. So when we make a model of our system of interest, the idea is that we're expecting that this functional relationship, phi, is the same at prototype scale as it is at model scale. So here's the term we want to find. This is the result of interest, and these are going to be computed at some condition of interest. And the idea behind model testing, in a, in a nutshell, is that if we can take whatever values, the numerical values of our independent pi terms at prototype scale, and we can produce those at model scale, we can then measure pi 1 at model scale and apply that to our prototype scale simply because we're recognizing that phi does not know the difference between our model and our prototype scale as long as the numbers that go into it and come out of it are the same. So it stands to reason then that in order to make this happen, we need to design an experiment such that pi 2 m is equal to pi 2 the prototype scale. Pi 3 m is equal to pi 3 at the prototype scale, so on and so forth. And if we do this, the result is that pi 1 m is going to be equal to pi 1 at the prototype scale, which gives us access now to our results of interest for the full scale. So this matching of pi terms is what's known as similitude or similarity. Okay, so similitude simply means um, that the behavior of two systems will obey the same relationships uh, between non-dimensional parameters. This idea that phi is going to remain the same. Um, so this occurs when we match all of our pi terms, as we suggested we need to do in the last slide. Um, and so for this reason, pi terms have another name. That's, we call them similarity parameters. Okay, I, The idea then is that um, you will have a similarity of the behaviors when the similarity parameters are equal at two scales. So for this to happen requires three different what we call similarity conditions. Geometric similarity, dynamic similarity, and kinematic similarity. Geometric similarity is a fairly intuitive one. This simply uh, states that all of the physical sizes and dimensions of our model must simply be perfectly scaled down versions of uh, those uh, at full scale. Okay, So if we have some length scale, such as in our previous example, the height of the building, then uh, if we create a model that has a height of LM, or L sub m, we could write that L over L sub m is equal to what we call a length scale factor. And this length scale factor has to also apply to, let's say we've got the width, the width of the model 
those the the ratio between those has to be the same as the ratio between the heights. Okay. Um, so geometric similarity requires scaling of, of, of all physical characteristics. This can be hard to do uh, because, for example, um, small things, small features like bolts or roughness or cracks in the concrete can be really challenging to scale down the model scale. Strictly speaking, it's necessary. Everything has to simply be perfectly maintained at a, in, a, in a smaller size. But in practice, small features such as roughness, bolts, etc., are often neglected in our model scale studies. So I want to reiterate, this is known as our, our length scale vector. <clears throat> okay, the second of these two similarity requirements is what we call dynamic similarity. And the idea here is that um, we need the ratios of types of forces to be maintained at model scale and at full scale. Okay, so this is where this idea, this, this uh, table that I showed in the very first slide um, comes back into play. This idea that, for example, the Reynolds number, right, which is written as oops, V rho L over mu, okay, is a ratio of inertia to viscous forces. Okay. Similarly, the fruit number, which is V over the square root of GL, is a force ratio between inertia gravitational force. So, uh, the requirement here to satisfy dynamic similarity, for example, is that the Reynolds number at the model scale has to equal the Reynolds number at the prototype scale. Because if you do this, this means that the balance between inertial, inertial and viscous forces at model scale will match the balance at the prototype scale, so on and so forth. Fruit number, we're correctly balancing inertia and gravitational forces. Um, Weber number means that we're uh, correctly balancing the uh, the ratio of inertial and surface tension forces, so on and so forth. Okay, so if we manage to do this, if we manage to satisfy all of the dynamic similarity requirements by matching all of our um, these important pi terms, then what happens is called kinematic similarity. So up to this point, we've said there's geometric similarity and dynamic similarity, and if both of those are satisfied, then we know that the forces are proportional to one another, and that all the geometry is maintained in our model, and the result will be that the flow effectively looks the same at model scale. So if we have the flow around some blunt object, right, or we have flow separation, and this is our, our prototype, then at model scale, if we have geometric similarity, it's the same size, dynamic similarity, which says that the balance between our different forces is maintained, we should have a flow that com looks completely identical. Our streamlines have the same shapes, ratios of velocities and accelerations will be identical. So, uh, enough with the, uh, the, the general description. Let's get into uh, one example before we close out this lecture. Uh, to do this, um, we're going to quickly, uh, a quick overview of um, how I like to formulate the process of going through model scale testing. Uh, so I had to do it in a six-step process, or I propose to do so in a six-step process, um, 
First, dimensional analysis, as we've uh, seen so far. Next would be computing the values of all the pi terms on the right-hand side of our relationship. So if we have pi 1, some unknown function of pi 2, pi 3, pi 4, etc. Okay, and this is at uh, prototype scale. The idea is that we want to calculate the values of these pi terms. And I'll add here at prototype scale. So each of these should actually have a number, right? We have to know the conditions we're interested in looking at, and those conditions should allow us to calculate, to assign an actual value to each of these pi terms. Uh, next is we're going to determine how large our model is going to be, use that to fix our geometric scale factor, and then use that geometric scale factor to correctly scale all the rest of the geometry so that we correctly maintain geometric similarity. Okay. In other words, all of the different features or lengths, L1 over L2 at model scale have to equal L1 or L2 at prototype scale. Next is going to be pick the model conditions. Okay, the actual the choice of fluid, the velocity, etc., uh, at which we're going to test the model experimentally in order to match all remaining pi terms on the right hand side. So I'm going to go ahead and write on the right hand side. Conduct the experiment measure the result of interest, and calculate the resulting pi term. In other words, calculate pi 1 at model scale. And then, at this point, our satisfaction of similarity, right? the fact that we maintained proper similarity, means that pi 1 p will be equal to pi 1 m, and we can use this to calculate U1P, the actual result of interest in engineering units that we're interested in looking for. So we're going to come back to this example of the wind force on a building. Okay, so some designers of this factory, instead of an office building, now it's a factory, um, they want to know uh, what the force exerted by the wind is when the wind is blowing 20 meters per second and the building has these uh, dimensions shown here. So 150 meters high, 30 meter smokestack with a half meter diameter, and then a 20 meter by 20 meter base footprint. Um, we're gonna go ahead, we can go ahead and assume, once again, that we've got windows, uh, though those really won't factor into, the, into the, uh, this example. Uh, the kicker here is that we have a wind tunnel, or uh, rather than a wind tunnel, let's just specify it as a, uh, we have an experimental facility, okay, because we're going to explore some of the alternate um, choices here instead of a wind tunnel. We have an experimental facility that can uh, be pressurized, if we wanted to, up to 10 atmospheres. Uh, it can accommodate different kinds of fluids, not just air, but also water, liquid, other liquids, etc. And it's large enough to accommodate a model that's up to 3.6 meters tall. How do we predict the drag? Going through a step-by-step -step process. Step one, perform the dimensional analysis. We've already done this, right? We've already uh, specified that our force, our drag coefficient, which is drag over rho v squared b squared, okay, is equal to a function of h over, well, we'll uh, rather rho B, B over U, there's our Reynolds number, then H over B, W over B, L over B, D over B, um, and the window dimensions, and the total number of windows. 
So there are nine pi terms. Um, so this actually takes care of steps one and two <coughs> because uh, step one is going to um, uh, tell us what the dimension, dimensional units are and step two is going to give us these pi terms. Um, or rather, uh, this, this leads to step two. In other words, um, at the conditions of interest, that is when, um, you know, for example, h over b, right, is equal to 150 over 20. So we're talking about 7.5, okay. w over b is equal to 1, etc. for all the dimensional, um, all the geometric terms. Our Reynolds number, which is rho b v over mu, this is density of air, 1.23 kilograms per meter cubed times 20 meters times 20 meters per second um, over 1.79 times 10 to the negative fifth newton second per meter squared okay, equals 2.75 times 10 to the seventh And you can go ahead and find a numerical value for all of these different terms up here. Step three is scale the geometry of the model. So we've already established, right, that our facility is limited to certain model sizes. In this case, we've said that the total height of the model, that is the height plus the smokestack height, can be a maximum of 3.6 meters. So we'll go ahead and select that as the uh, actual value of our, uh, of our model height. So if we do this, right, we've established that H plus L, right, the total height, um, or rather, we'll say H over H of the model okay, is equal to a value of 50. Right, because this is 150 meters uh, and what we would find is that um, our, our, our model can be H can be 3 meters tall okay. so we could go ahead and make a table that has right, our prototype and our model and each variable of interest. So we've got H, we've got B, W, L, D, H, W, W, W. We've got oops, 150 meters, 20 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters, 0 0.5 meters. Uh, we never defined a height width for the windows, so we'll go ahead and just leave those um, as variables for now. And then a model scale, the idea is we take this height and divide it by the scale factor of 50. So this is going to be 3 meters, okay, 0 0.4 meters, 0 0.4 meters, 0 0.6 meters, 0 0.01 meters, Right, which is one centimeter, and then one fiftieth, the full scale dimensions for the height and the width of the windows. Okay, so this is all that goes into uh, this is all that goes into geometric scaling or maintaining geometric similarity. It's the idea that every feature gets scaled by the same amount. The nice thing here. Right, is that if we look at our 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 uh, dimensional our dimensionless relationship, uh, if we say we've got d over rho v squared v squared is equal to some function of rho v v over mu h over b w over b um, W 
we'll use W over B and invert windows, is that by satisfying geometric similarity, okay, here it runs, we have taken care of all of the pi terms that involve only geometric features. Okay? This leaves only one single pi term, that is our Reynolds number, uh, left um, in, on the right-hand side of our equation. Okay. So what we need to do then to satisfy dynamic similarity is make sure that rho dv over mu at model scale equals rho dv over mu at prototype scale. So taking this relationship, let's go ahead and say we've got rho model d model v model over mu model okay, is equal to rho prototype d prototype v prototype over mu prototype. Uh, what a experimentalist might be most interested in is, you know, how fast does it have to go? What's the velocity? That's usually one of the most important questions you ask as an experimenter. What are the conditions of the test? So let's go ahead and take a look at that. The velocity of the model can be solved for, right? The model velocity ends up being the prototype velocity times the ratio dp dm times the ratio of rho p to rho m times the ratio of mu m to mu p, right? In other words, here we've got uh, our geometric scale factor. And then these two are uh, together, right? Dictated, dictated by the choice of fluid used in the experiment. Great, so we need to pick a fluid and then we'll be able to figure out what the velocity, um, sorry, at the velocity of our model test needs to be in order to accurately reproduce the full scale phenomena. So let's consider three fluids, right? Uh, so we've got this facility, it's a recirculating channel, sort of like a wind tunnel, but we can put whatever we want in it and we can pressurize the thing if we want. So let's consider air first. Regular old air at atmospheric pressure or standard temperature and pressure. We've got normal density, normal viscosity. In other words, this is the same fluid that we see at prototype scale. If we use air, this quantity ends up being one. This quantity ends up being one, right? Same fluid, and this quantity is 50. So we get that the model velocity has to be the prototype velocity times 50. Okay, Our prototype velocity was given in the beginning of the problem as VP equals 20 meters per second. They're interested in that particular wind speed. This leads then to 1,000 meters per second, which is ridiculous. That's far too fast for most, if not all, um, uh, experimental facilities. We're talking about hypersonic flow at this point. What if we cranked up the pressure in our test facility? If we pressurized it to 10 bar, bar okay? according to the ideal gas law, this means that we scale up the density by a factor of 10 without touching the viscosity. So now our scaling becomes that the density 1 over 10, okay, because the model scale density is 10 times greater than the prototype scale velocity. This is still 50, and this is 1. So we end up with VP times not 50, but 5, which leads to 100 meters per second. This is a much more reasonable number. This is something that a modern wind tunnel can actually achieve. What if we filled it with water? Okay, similar idea. So water, we've got rho, um, oh, we have the density and viscosity given right there. Uh, this ends up being the prototype scale velocity times the ratio of viscosities ends up being 0 
Um, sorry, one moment. Zero, one, two, three. Okay. Here's our 50, and this ends up being 62.6, which gives us a model scale velocity of 3.85 times. or 77 meters per second, and similar idea, what if we filled it with gasoline, okay? Um, we turned down the, the, the density a little bit, we turned down the viscosity a lot. And so here we would have, this is now 0 0.0018, is 50, and this is 17.3. This would give us 1.57 times the prototype fail scale velocity, or 31.3 meters per second. So the idea here is all we know is that the Reynolds numbers have to match and in order for that to happen we have a couple knobs we can turn. Some of those knobs we turn by changing the fluid, others we change by uh, altering the conditions of the fluid such as the pressure, and others we change by altering the test conditions themselves such as the velocity at which we're testing our model. So we've got four different choices of fluids and coming from this matching of Reynolds numbers comes four different resulting velocities that we would have to use to accurately reproduce the dynamic behavior of this 20 meters per second. Uh, looking at this right here, we could pick any of these, but I'm inclined to go with this air at 10 bar, right? This 100 meters per second in a pressurized tunnel uh, appeals to me as being the most realistic and the most achievable condition. So next up is performing the model scale experiments. Okay, so let's uh, um, let's consider. Um, oops, this is not the right drag force. Uh, I recalculated this, and a more realistic number is actually the model drag, one hundred kilonewtons. Okay, I do want to note that this is a huge force. Okay, this is almost. 25,000 pounds force. So this is not a small experiment we're conducting. However, we'll see in a second that this is still much, much smaller than the force that's going to be on the actual building. So the idea here is we build our model, right? It's a 3.6 meter high model. We put it in our wind tunnel. We pressurize the wind tunnel and we run it at 100 meters per second. And whatever type of load measurement device we attach to the base of that building, this is what we measure. Next. We're going to calculate the drag coefficient of the model, that is, the model drag over rho model v model squared times v model squared. Okay, and this is going to give us a value of 5.08. All right, great. So now at this point, we've satisfied geometric similarity by matching the Reynolds number. We've uh, we've satisfied dynamic similarity, and because we've gotten those two, we can count on kinematic similarity. And because all these similarity relationships are met, this means that the prototype drag coefficient is going to be equal to our model drag coefficient of 5.08. So expanding the results to full scale becomes trivial. The drag prototype scale then becomes 5.08 times rho, the prototype, times v, the prototype squared, times b, the prototype squared. Okay, 5.08 times 1.23 kilograms per meter cubed, times 20 meters per second squared, times 20 meters squared will work out to 50. 6.25 meganewtons. We're talking here 5.625 times 10 to the seventh newtons. That's about 10 million pounds or over 10 million pounds force. Okay, much larger force um, than at model scale. But the beauty of this is that we were able to get a uh, 
A result here that would be almost impossible to measure at full scale directly, we are able to actually conduct a rigorous experiment in a manageable facility in a way that saves money, because we don't have to build a full scale thing to test with, saves challenge with instrumentation, Okay, much easier to find a load cell that will measure this quantity than it is to find one that will measure this quantity, and safety. Right? What happens if you don't just properly design the, uh, the full scale model or the full scale building and you go out and test it? You have a building falling over. At model scale, a 3.6 meter high test building is much less dangerous if it topples over than a 180 meter tall office building or factory. Okay, so uh, that wraps up the example. I have just a few closing remarks here. Okay, this is a um, what we would call a typical um, example of a flow around an immersed body. In this case, the body was the building, and it was immersed in air. Okay, uh, so there there are classic or common types of experiments that usually have certain similarity requirements attached to them. Dealing with flow through pipes or closed conduits, usually the Reynolds number is the only thing that comes into play. So it requires what we call Reynolds scaling. Uh, for examples like the one we just did, flow around bodies, Reynolds number becomes important, and if compressibility is a big issue, Mach number becomes important. Flows with a free surface, things like flows around ships, flows through rivers, or over dams, ocean environments, etc. We have Reynolds number, Froude number, and the Weber number all have similarity requirements. Um, in other words, you have to match all of these numbers at model scale and prototype scale. Uh, so in summary here, right, we've shown the similarity parameters. Um, we, we, we found all these similarity parameters, or pi terms, right? What we've called pi terms, okay? Uh, we've determined those from scratch so far in this chapter. Um, however, many of these similarity parameters, they show up all over the place, okay? Things like the Reynolds number, Froude number, or um, this example here, what we call the drag coefficient. Uh, and there are certain standard conventions uh, have become uh, have come about through uh, years of testing. Uh, so in the example we just conducted, we defined our drag coefficient as d over rho v squared b squared, right? If we had chosen height as being one of our repeating variables, it would have been h squared, etc. Uh, what's more common, and we'll see this in chapter 9, is to use the drag over one half rho v squared times some reference area. In this case, that area would be B times H, the frontal projected area of the building. Okay, This is not a super important distinction right now because as long as these similarity requirements are met, okay, the choice of how you define those similarity parameters will not be important. So both of these are dimensionless. Okay. And so as long as you observe uh, proper scaling procedures, either one of these definitions will give you the exact same result. Okay, so that wraps up Chapter 7. Uh, I hope that this has been an informative uh, video lecture. Uh, and I'm excited to begin Chapter 8 with you guys the next time we meet in person. Thanks for watching.